Hello again, Hello. and welcome Hello. back uh, with us today as we continue our exploration of Cold War Secrets Revealed. We are being joined virtually by Eli Rosenbaum, the Director of Human Rights Enforcement Strategy and Policy Section of the Department of Justice. Mr. Rosenbaum and Greg Peterson will have a conversation about his involvement while serving as the director of the Department of Justice's Office of Special Investigations in the decades long prosecution case against John Demianuk, a German court later convicted Demianuk of acting as an accessory to the murder as a former concentration camp guard. Interviews, of, interviews with Mr. Rosenbaum are in the Netflix documentary film, The Devil Next Door. He received his BA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and his JD from Harvard Law School. Eli, welcome. Thank you, uh, Kristen, so much. Uh, Ken, uh, am I uh, audible? I can be heard. Hello, can you hear me now? Hey, hey Eli. Hey, Greg, uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, we can. Great. So uh, greetings uh, from uh, the United States Department of Justice in, in Washington, D.C., uh, or uh, to be precise, from my office at home uh, in a Washington suburb. Uh, I, I regret greatly that I can't be with everyone in person in Jamestown this morning. Uh, I've had such great uh, experiences at the center in the past, um, but I'm glad that technology permits me to participate remotely. I, I look uh, forward very much to the discussion that I'm uh, about to have with uh, Jackson Center founder and my dear friend Greg Peterson about the Demianio case and, and other cases that my uh, former office at the uh, Justice Department's Criminal Division, the Office of Special Investigations, OSI, and its uh, successor, Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, HRSP, have brought against uh, World War II era participants in Nazi-sponsored crimes of persecution uh, since our program's inception by order of then Attorney General Benjamin Civiletti in 1979. Uh, as um, the audience uh, may know, or at least surmise at this late date, when only a small percentage of Nazi perpetrators um, remain alive, the vast bulk of HRSP's enforcement work in the human rights uh, space involves abuses committed after World War II in such places as Rwanda, Bosnia, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. Uh, and I think you'll be uh, seeing a little bit uh, about that uh, in the press in, in the coming days. That's all I could say about that. But anyway, the, the work that we do in uh, what I uh, typically call our modern cases is a, a story for another day. Uh, it's so appropriate that we address the topic of the pursuit of justice in the Nazi cases uh, today uh, at the Jackson Center. This is the month in which we mark the 75th anniversary of the rendering of judgment at the most important of the trials of Nazi criminals at, at Nuremberg, Germany. Justice Jackson was the principal architect of that landmark in international law and human rights accountability. Of his many extraordinary accomplishments, the trial before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg is arguably his, his greatest. And no institution in the entire world has done more than has the Robert H. Jackson Center to ensure that the legacy and record of the Nuremberg trials is preserved and made accessible to scholars and the general public throughout the world. So let me start by sending hearty bravos and thanks and congratulations to the Robert H. Jackson Center on 20 years of fabulous work. Uh, before, uh, Greg, you and I have our, our discussion, um, our conversation, I thought it might be helpful to present uh, a little background on how the Cold War affected the pursuit of justice in the Nazi cases, and not only in the United States. Uh, I'm disappointed that no one has yet attempted to write, uh, uh, write this admittedly complex history, even in a, in a, in a, in a survey kind of article, uh, maybe something for me to do in my uh, future retirement. Um, uh, so just a sort of uh, tip of the iceberg stuff. Uh, the Soviet Union was of course a major participant in the 1945 planning of the Nuremberg IMT trial 
and then was uh, one of the four allied powers that prosecuted and judged the case. It really could hardly have been otherwise. Uh, the Soviet Union bore the brunt of the combat, the brunt of the um, uh, combat losses, uh, the largest uh, uh, share of uh, civilian casualties by far. Um, uh, anyway, um, uh, Soviet participation, however, caused numerous problems. It, it caused a, a number of uh, concerns to arise uh, uh, on the part of Justice Jackson, also created a variety of awkward situations before and during the trial proceedings, most uh, notably when the Soviets insisted on presenting the infamous massacre at Katyn, Poland as a German crime when it was widely believed and many years later confirmed uh, to have been carried out by the Soviets themselves. Uh, another uh, major point of friction came when uh, Nuremberg defendants sought to introduce evidence regarding the secret protocol to the 1939 so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact, the German-Soviet uh, non-aggression pact. Um, that secret protocol uh, was made public at the trial uh, much to Moscow's uh, chagrin uh, and embarrassment. Um, uh, I would refer anyone interested in the details of what transpired um, regarding Soviet participation at Nuremberg, which are absolutely fascinating to uh, Professor Francine Hirsch's magisterial book, uh, Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, published by Oxford uh, just last year. You'll learn about such things as how it, it happened that um, the uh, a crime uh, of aggression, uh, now also called the crime against peace, uh, came to be in the Nuremberg Charter based on the uh, scholarship of um, a, a, a Soviet law professor, Aaron Trainin, uh, not nearly as known as he, he should be. Um, I was surprised uh, years ago when I, I learned that um, it was the Soviets who initially pushed this uh, one would think that um, Stalin, who after all had uh, committed that crime uh, on any number of occasions, including by invading both Finland and Poland, uh, would have been um, uh, a dead set against uh, such a crime being included. But uh, Professor um, uh, Hirsch explains uh, uh, how and why that, that came to be. In any event, uh, tensions between the Soviet government and the West long predated World War II, of, cor of course, and, and the Cold War, which most scholars um, say began in 1947 with a well-known uh, Truman speech, um, arguably was in its at least nascent stage even before the war ended. And no sooner had the war ended in Europe when both East and West competed to gain the services of intelligence officers and engineers and scientists and others uh, who'd been in the employ of, of Nazi Germany. Uh, um, the United States uh, and its allies, of course, had long distrusted the Soviets and were very much opposed to um, uh, their rejection of capitalism and, and institution of communism. Uh, the Soviets, uh, Stalin at least, um, believed that the Western allies had delayed uh, military actions uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, against Germany, uh, so that the Soviets would uh, have to bear uh, the largest part of, uh, of combat and combat losses. So there was a lot of, of bitterness on both sides. But when the, as the war ended, the U.S. and the Soviet Union in particular uh, sought to, to use the current parlance, repurpose uh, the, uh, the uh, efforts of uh, uh, supposed talents of uh, men who had worked for the Nazis, uh, repurpose them in, in the great and terrible uh, Cold War that would dominate world geopolitics for the next four plus decades. And when these men's uh, skills were deemed useful, uh, their Nazi pasts were conveniently overlooked and they worked, uh, went to work for their new employers in Washington, Moscow and elsewhere, spared uh, uh, typically from prosecution. In the United States, incriminated men like Arthur Rudolph, a former Nazi slave master later brought to justice by my office, former office OSI, uh, rose to positions of prominence in the defense and space programs, many of them brought to our country under a once secret War Department program called Project Paperclip. So each side of the Cold War, so to speak, uh, 
that is uh, uh, viewed its its part of Germany uh, as an, uh, necessary, uh, a necessary frontline ally uh, in, in the great struggle. Trials of Nazi criminals were not popular, to put it mildly, in Germany. And so enthusiasm uh, among US, uh, Soviet, and other leaders who wanted uh, you know, to, to use those people on the front lines, uh, their enthusiasm uh, uh, for continuing to pursue justice waned rapidly after the Nuremberg IMT trial uh, concluded. By 1950, the trials East and West were mostly ended, even though the vast majority of the perpetrators had never been prosecuted. Um, as, as the words of a formerly classified 1948 uh, British communication to uh, other Commonwealth nations had candidly put it, in calling for an end to Nazi prosecutions, quote, it is now necessary to dispose of the past as soon as possible. And that of course is, is generally speaking what happened. And as we uh, meet today in 2021, it is uh, a tragic reality that uh, again, the vast majority of uh, perpetrators of, of Nazi crimes were, were never brought to justice. Uh, West Germany in the 50s exploited America's need for its cooperation by pressing the State Department to um, uh, 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 get uh, death sentences uh, commuted and um, uh, uh, imprisonment sentences uh, reduced, uh, particularly those that had been rendered at the so-called Nuremberg subsequent trials. And sure enough, in the 1950s, most of the death sentences were in fact commuted and the convicted Nazi criminals all ultimately released. Uh, the last of those men, uh, a, a major officer in the dreaded Einsatzgruppen mobile killing units, who was sentenced to death uh, at the US Einsatzgruppen trial at Nuremberg, died only a little over a decade ago in freedom in Germany. By the early 1960s, uh, the Soviets found it useful to weaponize the issue of unpunished Nazi criminals. Uh, and so Moscow outed, so to speak, alleged Nazi criminals in West Germany, the United States, England, Australia, and elsewhere, often through propaganda efforts that were heavy handed and sometimes inaccurate. Um, and uh, because of that, they tended to undermine uh, Western leaders' confidence in their veracity, uh, also Western media uh, uh, confidence. Uh, but many of the men they exposed were in fact complicit in Nazi crimes. Uh, for the reason I just gave, I suppose, uh, Western governments largely reacted to these charges by doing some preliminary investigation sometimes, but ultimately taking no action, uh, distrustful uh, as they were of the Soviet Union. But Moscow continued to expose Nazi perpetrators in the West throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. John Demyanyuk was, was one such person exposed in Soviet propaganda in the 1970s. Um, the very, I think the first or second such person who had ever been exposed uh, in, in our country was Carl Linnis, uh, a former um, uh, uh, senior officer at the Nazi concentration camp at Tar Tartu, Estonia. He was exposed in 1961 during the time of the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. His case was very briefly covered by the, the New York media because he was living on, on Suffolk County, in Suffolk County, Long Island. Uh, and then the government did nothing, uh, at least uh, until my office was created in 1979 uh, at the Department of Justice. And we soon um, commenced a suit against him, but after a 20 year delay. Um, from Moscow's perspective, these exposés of uh, alleged Nazis in the West were uh, obviously seen as quite useful. Uh, presumably uh, in part because they, uh, they countered, in a way, uh, Western efforts to highlight the large-scale uh, Soviet domestic human rights abuses that earned the Soviet Union notoriety uh, throughout the world. Uh, after all, uh, uh, as Soviet spokesmen loudly proclaimed, the West is harboring the worst human rights violators of all Nazi criminals. Things finally uh, uh, changed in the United States um, as a result of uh, uh, a number of uh, occurrences, the first of them being the uh, exposure in uh, New York City in the mid-1960s of a woman named 
Romina Braunstein Orion. Um, uh, she had been a brutal guard at the Nazi concentration camps at Majdanek and Ravensbrück and was, uh, she later married an American serviceman and was uh, uh, living as a housewife in, in Queens, New York. Uh, she was exposed uh, in the pages of the New York Times uh, when uh, information was brought to the attention of the uh, famed Vienna-based Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal that she uh, had escaped to the United States uh, and he gave it to New York Times. Um, uh, that um, uh, exposure and her uh, resulting extradition to Germany in 1973 uh, caused uh, a number of reporters in the United States to wonder if there were other Nazi criminals here. And they soon came upon uh, uh, these uh, many years of uh, Soviet ex exposés and they pursued those in particular and found that there was uh, solid evidence uh, that appeared to um, uh, support those, those charges. Uh, so there were uh, in, uh, numerous uh, articles about alleged Nazi criminals in the New York Times, uh, in the New York Daily News, in the Chicago Sun-Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and on and on. Uh, and it's sort of a typical Washington story. Eventually, there was enough uh, media coverage that uh, it created kind of a critical mass that caused Congress to act. Uh, particularly one, um, uh, uh, one member of Congress, Elizabeth Holtzman uh, uh, in New York, who uh, instigated uh, hearings in the late 1970s that really um, uh, shocked the nation. Uh, hearings that exposed uh, uh, the fact that Nazi criminals had come here and little had been done uh, to, to investigate or, or prosecute them. Uh, that in turn led in 1979 uh, to um, Attorney General Benjamin Civiletti in the Carter administration, uh, ordering the creation of the Office of Special Investigations. Uh, and we started to work. Our, our work got a lot of media attention and, and that helped inspire later in the 1980s, um, the creation of similar units in Canada, England, and Australia. All of us, all of the units, um, uh, uh, dealt with the Soviet Union, received evidence from the Soviet Union. Um, uh, the United States and um, Canada in particular uh, brought cases uh, in which uh, evidence that came from Soviet archives and testimonial evidence from witnesses in the Soviet Union uh, were, were, um, uh, were used in litigation. Uh, and that was perceived by defendants in those cases as uh, the prosecution's uh, Achilles heel. Uh, they uh, routinely denied the authenticity of documents, uh, incriminating documents that came from Soviet archives. They repeatedly uh, challenged the truthfulness of witnesses in the Soviet Union, many of whom uh, had been prosecuted and uh, convicted and imprisoned in the Soviet Union because they were uh, comrades, so to speak, of, of these individuals in the United States, and they had firsthand knowledge of what their former comrades had done, the same things that they had done, participate in mass killings. Um, uh, there, was, uh, there were a number of um, commentators and activists who seized upon uh, this issue as well, most notably Patrick Buchanan, uh, who um, uh, attacked us for many years for what we saw as doing nothing more than following the evidentiary trail uh, where it led to the scene of the crimes and to uh, archives in which uh, evidence were posed. Uh, this was a hard fought battle, particularly in the Vignano case. Uh, and it persisted even after the collapse of the Soviet Union around 1990, 91, uh, and the um, uh, termination of uh, communist rule uh, in, in, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, a lot of interesting stories that come out of all of those battles, and uh, perhaps Greg and I will get into some of them. Greg, it's all so, yours. So, wow. This is Eli Rosenbaum. Eli Rosenbaum, who has been considered, and you hate the term, I know it, a Nazi hunter. Among the variety of things that uh, you've been termed as the world's most successful Nazi hunter by British historian Guy Walters in the book dealing with John Damianic. Uh, 
Richard Rashke said, as new revelations about Nazi war criminals and their collaborators find their way into the media, Americans who do care will have Eli Rosenbaum and former U.S. Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman to thank. He also went on uh, the Washington Post in an interview, said, called you a modern day superhero. And under your leadership, the OSI was called the most successful government Nazi hunting, uh, hunting organization on earth. And you way back when, in remarks to the Nuremberg 50th anniversary reunion of the Nuremberg staff, uh, allowed us how that uh, the OSI's comparatively small staff of attorneys, historians and support personnel have been responsible for bringing and winning far more such prosecutions than any other law enforcement unit of its kind in the world. And I know that's empirically confirmed. I know that you're one to not take the spotlight whatsoever. Uh, but I'm going to jump to a moment in time where, in fact, you were a spotlight person. You were on national television. You had to uh, ultimately uh, it, it dealt with um, a book, which I have and which we talked about earlier today uh, called Betrayal, uh, dealing with your work when you were at the World Jewish Congress, uh, which and, and you set this up in your preliminary remarks talking about how a variety of people who were uh, in the Nazi party were repurposed and became uh, members of society in general, perhaps no more so than Kurt Waldheim. When you launched into this, did you know the firestorm you would be getting into? Well, first of all, let me just uh, uh, note that um, because I worked on the Waldheim matter uh, outside the Justice Department during um, a several year period when I was um, outside DOJ. Uh, the first thing I did when I returned to DOJ in 1988 was recuse myself. So anything I say about Waldheim will be uh, my personal uh, opinion, um, uh, not uh, in any way um, uh, an official comment by the Department of Justice. Um, well, as I relate in my long out of print book, uh, we were very naive. Uh, we live in a country where um, the disclosure of a presidential candidate's uh, uh, affair uh, led to his having to withdraw from, uh, from the race. Uh, so we assumed uh, at the World Jewish Congress that once we um, made public the evidence um, that we had found initially uh, of uh, this great cover-up by Kurt Waldheim, uh, uh, who had uh, already finished his, his term at the United Nations and was now running for presidency in Austria. Once we exposed um, that evidence, he would immediately withdraw. Uh, we were, of course, totally wrong. Uh, we thought uh, that it would be a big news story for one or two days until he withdrew. We never imagined that he would fight on, much less that... Um, uh, he would get elected, uh, despite uh, all the revelations uh, that ensued over the next months, uh, as more and more documentary evidence was unearthed by us uh, and by, by others. Uh, he was ultimately uh, barred by the um, uh, United States government um, uh, from uh, entering the United States. He was the first head of state uh, ever formally barred from coming to this country. Uh, and the uh, long investigative uh, report that uh, OSI prepared uh, was eventually made public and it can be uh, read at uh, DOJ's uh, website. Uh, that information, this is right towards the end of when we know the Cold War sort of ends, the Berlin Wall, but did, did you get a sense of your expose that that was a... Uh, an enhancing aspect of the Cold War discussion of, of you know, this was pretty, pretty revolutionary. Well, the, the Cold War aspect that most comes to mind in connection with Kurt Waldheim um, is um, the, the, the evidence indicates um, that uh, both the Soviets and the Yugoslavs uh, knew about uh, his, his uh, wartime uh, misconduct 
uh, they knew about the cover-up and they used that information for their own benefit. Again, I outlined that in the book and there's an excellent uh, British television program that uh, uh, reached the same conclusion uh, after, uh, after I did. Um, uh, it, for those of us who are uh, students of United Nations history, uh, uh, it will be recalled that when Waldheim as Austria's UN representative was a candidate for the presidency uh, of the UN, which was about 1970, I think, um, uh, the other candidates uh, were vetoed uh, by the Soviet Union, including a candidate who one might have thought they would have favored, um, uh, uh, Mr. Jakobsen of Finland, because Finland um, had uh, limited ability to withstand Soviet pressure back in those days. Uh, but they, they vetoed everyone. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the evidence indicates that the United States did not uh, know much about Waldheim's uh, uh, war past, uh, did not realize that he would be susceptible to blackmail uh, by uh, uh, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Uh, and so uh, we went along with, uh, with the favored Soviet candidate and uh, he was secretary general in New York for 10 years, uh, during which time I, I, I might add, um, the Soviets um, scored major, a major intelligence victory uh, there. Um, the um, uh, foreign uh, diplomats at the Soviet Union, I'm sorry, foreign diplomats at the UN are limited in, uh, at least they were back then, I don't know what the rule is now, in how far they're allowed to travel from New York, I think it's 25 or 50 miles for security reasons, um, US security reasons. Uh, however, foreign nationals uh, employed at the UN Secretariat uh, face no such restrictions. And the Soviet Union during uh, Waldheim's tenure launched an effort to uh, increase dramatically the number of Soviet nationals employed by the UN Secretariat. And they succeeded in that. And well, guess what? Uh, Soviet nationals um, uh, called in sick a lot more often than one might have expected. Uh, and when they were supposedly sick, uh, they traveled throughout the United States, uh, obviously uh, conducting uh, intelligence, uh, performing intelligence functions. So um, this was a, um, an unfortunate um, uh, intelligence uh, debacle for the United States, in my personal opinion, I hate to say that. <laughs> Personally, uh, you were born uh, in Westbury and graduating summa cum laude at Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, got your MBA. And then uh, you went to the Justice Department through its honors program through Harvard Law School in 1980. And was that the beginning? What was the aha moment for you, Eli, that said this concept of uh, personal accountability and, and potential criminal activity that you ultimately launched into started. We're, we're, do, is there a genesis in all of this? I suppose there is. Uh, uh, the Holocaust um, uh, was not spoken of uh, in my home. Uh, remember, I grew up uh, you know, in, in the early 60s, so the war was, was not a distant memory. Um, and I'm from a Jewish family. My parents were escapees before the war from Germany. My dad fought uh, in the war in, in uh, North Africa and in, uh, in Europe, stayed on for uh, the early part of the US occupation of, of Germany. And um, it was clear that that was not something that you could discuss in my house. Uh, and it wasn't much in, in, in what I read. Um, like most kids, I read the Diary of Aaron Frank uh, in elementary school. That was most of what, most of my exposure to the subject. Until when I was about 14, I uh, told the story elsewhere. Uh, I was um, in, a, in a car that my dad was driving on the New York State uh, Thruway, uh, not so far probably from the Jamestown Center, in a blizzard. And we were just talking. There was nothing that my dad cared to listen to on the radio. Uh, and... Uh, we were talking about his 
his war service. And he had some actually entertaining stories. He had once uh, 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 boxed for his unit against another unit. First time I ever heard that my father was a boxer. He wasn't really, and he lost, I'm sure. Um, uh, and, uh, and then he said, you know, um, I uh, was sent to Dachau concentration camp the day after its liberation to report back on what had happened there. And um, uh, my eyes, like my father's, were locked on the road because it was, uh, there was a lot of snow there. And this was treacherous driving. Um, and I said uh, something in the nature of what would a 14 year old kid say? Wow, you know, what did you see? And I waited for my father to respond and I heard nothing. And finally I looked over and my dad's eyes had welled with tears and he was clearly trying to speak. His mouth was open and he couldn't do it. And uh, my father lived a nice long life uh, well into this century. Um, we talked often about uh, my work but we never returned to that subject. That was the first time I saw my father cry and the men of that greatest generation uh, were, uh, didn't want anyone to see them cry in general. Um, then um, uh, I happened upon uh, an NBC broadcast of a German play based on the Auschwitz trial of the mid 1960s. The play was called The Investigation. It had been on Broadway, then NBC aired it on a Friday and a Sunday. Uh, and um, that play uh, had actors playing, uh, among others, uh, uh, concentration camp victims. And I remember being shocked when a woman uh, witness talked about ghastly medical experiments that had been perpetrated on her and others. And again, I didn't know anything about that. So uh, I'm sure that had a, an impact on the young Eli Rosenbaum. Uh, finally, when I went to law school, assuming that I was going to um, go into the business world after law school. After all, I had an undergraduate and MBA degree, uh, both in finance uh, from Wharton. Um, <laughs> in my first year, I volunteered uh, in a student group that assisted the local district attorney's office um, in criminal prosecutions. Um, just seemed like that would be interesting. And I ended up working on a, a rape case that again, shocked me. It was uh, you know, the classic nightmarish situation of a woman walking down the street, in this case in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and grabbed and pulled into the bushes and, and brutally raped. Um, and um, that was the first time that I thought, gee, maybe I'd like to be a prosecutor um, and help bring such people to justice. Then when I learned uh, the following year, I suppose, that uh, they had uh, opened uh, this uh, new uh, unit at justice to pursue Nazi war criminals. I thought that's the summer job for me. I got it somehow, uh, fell in love with the people who were doing the work in awe of their commitment and determination and smarts. Uh, and the work itself was fascinating. Uh, and my uh, highest ambition then after law school was to be a prosecutor specifically at OSI. And um, uh, although my other fondest ambition uh, did not come true, which was to play center field for the Yankees. Uh, <laughs> I blame that uh, completely, not my fault. It's just an innate lack of talent. Blame my parents for that. Um, I did get to realize my other fond ambition and go to OSI. Eli, I know you're a big fan of, of uh, audio, radio. You you know, you love that stuff. And you also, uh, we have an audience of people from Washington, D.C. Uh, that you are uh, looking for a particular uh, uh, piece of TV history and you haven't yet. So uh, maybe I'll just give you a plug, an opportunity to tell you what the, we're looking for because I know I'm looking for it. They'll find it uh, if you want to give them a teaser here. Well, why don't I say you and I are both looking for, for two things. Uh, one is the landmark interview that Justice Jackson gave to uh, Armed Forces Radio uh, during the Nuremberg trial. Uh, he um, would not give any other interviews, I believe, during the trial, but he made an exception for Armed Forces uh, Radio, which after all uh, was serving uh, the men and women who um, had uh, um, uh, risked their lives um, uh, to, to bring an end to the nightmare of Nazi and humanity in Europe. Uh, the transcript of, of that interview survives. Uh, the Jackson Center um, uh, has uh, hosted the 
the, the men who, who, who wrote uh, the, that uh, account and uh, wrote the uh, uh, interview questions and, and uh, helped, uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, and others connected with, with, with those uh, broadcasts. But um, the recording itself has never been found if there is one. And I think Greg is hot on the trail of, of that one. Uh, if anyone, uh, the one that I'm looking for, and I think I have it on an old VHS cassette I just can't find, is the original interview of Kurt Waldheim on American television uh, in March of 1986, I think it was March 4, um, by Jane Pauley of the Today Show, uh, uh, live via satellite. And uh, that interview actually, uh, I think, remains um, the best one that was ever done of all time. Mean, Ms. Pauley just would not let go did not let him uh, sneak out of uh, answering uh, questions. She took it more rounds, so to speak, than Mike Wallace subsequently did, or um, uh, Ted Koppel uh, for Nightline, um, but I can't find it. So one of these things, if anybody is uh, watching from NBC, I would sure love to see that posted someplace. There we go, everybody. There's your, there's your assignment. Uh, Eli, you, you've had an extensive career in tracking down uh, Germans, specifically Nazi party affiliates who got into our country. In doing so, um, and there, is a, there are some you know, literature on this, to what extent was the United States complicit uh, and other in encouraging, this is the Operation Paperclip, and things like that. And how difficult was that for you to kind of overcome in your prosecuting people who clearly had committed crimes, were induced, if you will, to come here, perhaps assisted in how they filled out the forms. How did you deal with that? Arthur Rudolph in particular. Well, you know, it's a sad part of our, our history that um, we use these people and other countries, including the Soviet Union did as well. Uh, it's it's uh, been said uh, by a, 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 someone more clever than I that the, the, the Nazis were in a sense um, winners of, of the Cold War. They exploited it, uh, so many of them, to uh, uh, evade prosecution. Uh, Rudolf, uh, uh, for decades, being one of those, those people. Uh, well, you know, when we were developing that case and also a uh, a prosecution that we commenced of um, Otto Albrecht von Bolschwing earlier, uh, who was an aide to Adolf Eichmann, believe it or not, the, the so-called architect of the final solution, man who organized the transports of, of, of Jews, uh, especially to, to, to uh, their doom in the East, um, and who you can say now uh, later worked for the CIA uh, and ultimately settled in Sacramento, California. There was a concern um, um, among many of us that uh, the administrations of those days uh, would not permit us to, to go forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that Democrat or Republican, uh, we never would, uh, no matter who was in power, we were never told, no, um, you, can't, you can't take on that case. Uh, I, I will say that I, I often uh, wondered um, as we were investigating uh, and then pursuing the Arthur Rudolph matter. Um, Rudolph had become uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, project director of, uh, no, you know, now I'm blanking on the title, but he was in charge of building the Saturn V rocket for NASA. Uh, so he built the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969. Uh, I was concerned that, um, you know, or I wondered what would have happened if uh, his mentor, Werner von Braun, uh, had still been alive. He had died a few years earlier, I think here in Virginia. Uh, and um, uh, I imagined that had he still been alive, the first call that Rudolf would have made after uh, I sent him a letter asking him to uh, come for an interview uh, would have been placed to Werner von Braun. Von Braun could get presidents of the United States on the phone, starting way back with John F. Kennedy, and all the way on to the end of his life. Uh, and I uh, imagine that Rudolph would have called von Braun, who would have picked up the phone, called president of the day, 
and said, please, Mr. President, you need to stop this. This will be colossally embarrassing, uh, uh, not only to Rudolph, but to the space program. Uh, and perhaps that would have succeeded. Uh, before I forget, if I could just mention, I, I wanted to say something further about the Soviets in Valheim. One of the most remarkable things that I saw in researching Kurt Valheim was uh, an article that appeared in the Soviet English language publication, New Times, not to be confused with an American publication of the same title. And it was you know, uh, presenting to uh, the English speaking Western world, the Soviet view of things. And they had a small piece on Kurt Waldheim when he was elected Secretary General of the United Nations. And anyone who knows modern Soviet history knows that the Soviets never, ever forget the terrible suffering that they endured and their heroic uh, combat operations during the Second World War. It's a formative experience, even for people born long after the war. Uh, in the uh, former Soviet Union and its uh, uh, and, and and now Russia, um, and yet in this um, little article, uh, as they recounted uh, Kurt Waldheim's biography, and they mentioned that he had uh, graduated, I think, from the Diplomatic Academy uh, um, just before the war, and then the next thing, suddenly, it's he joined the Austrian diplomatic service uh, in in 1945, 46, whatever it was. Um, they uh, skipped over completely uh, the war years, which were, of course, uh, well known uh, to everyone. Uh, I mean, the, the basic outline of it, that he served in the German army, was never a secret. Um, and yet the Soviets skipped it. I thought that at, that spoke volumes about what was going on. You... By the way, your dad, just as a, a postscript, uh, said... Uh... Uh, or mentioned the fact that he had interviewed Lenny Riefenstahl. Did he ever talk about that? He did. He did. Um, and I only learned about that when I was a student at Penn uh, and in a semester when I think I may have carried a, uh, an unusually high uh, course load, um, I decided to take a, a course in cinema. And um, uh, one of the first uh, films that our professor showed us was Lenny Riefenstahl's The Triumph of the Will. I have to admit, I had not heard of her or the movie. And afterwards, I mentioned to my dad what we had been uh, shown in class, and he said, "Oh, you know, I, I, um, I, uh, our unit interviewed Lenny Riefenstahl um, uh, after the war when uh, we interviewed quite a lot of uh, what we would today call uh, high high value uh, detainees." And um, he said, "I still have the uh, the report we did on 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 that interview. <laughs> uh, do you think your professor might like to see it?" And I said, yeah, I think he might. So my dad photocopied it and sent it and I, I gave it to, uh, to my professor. Uh, my father um, actually, uh, who was of course uh, far from sympathetic to any of these people, um, thought that, um, had some sympathy for, for Lenny Riefenstahl for some reason. Uh, and I remember him uh, telling me that uh, his team uh, all knew of her as a, uh, a, a famous German actress. She was quite beautiful. Uh, and they were shocked to see what she looked like uh, when when uh, when she came in for questioning. Uh, I will say uh, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I was pleased uh, to read in her her memoirs uh, that uh, she wrote that she was properly uh, treated by by her captors. At the Jackson Center here, we have a, an exhibit downstairs called the Perpetrators, which has a number of the uh, uh, perpetrators of the, the Holocaust and uh, related. And Arthur Rudolph is right there. And I, we have a picture of you next to Arthur Rudolph. And uh, you told the story. Uh, I wonder if you would repeat it as to after Rudolph had agreed to kind of be extradited uh, to Germany, he was, had second thoughts whether he would actually go to Germany and tried another route. Could you talk about that story? Well, he, he, he agreed to return to Germany and he did. And then um, supporters of, of his, um, uh, including other former uh, German uh, rocket engineers who were perhaps worried about their own situations in the United States, um, uh, 
loudly came to his defense and persuaded him to try to come back to the United States. Uh, so he, um, he uh, flew to Canada, to Toronto, and met with some supporters. And uh, the plan, we were told, was uh, that they were going to come to Niagara Falls, Ontario, and march over, is it the Peace Bridge, I think, into yep, yep, yep. Niagara Falls, um, uh, New York. And uh, they were to be accompanied uh, by a Congressman uh, Jim Traficant of Ohio, one of the few members of Congress who um, um, was hostile to our work. Uh, and I think his motivation was, uh, 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 the late Congressman's motivation was um, antipathy towards the Justice Department, which had prosecuted him uh, for fraud, including tax fraud, and had succeeded in that. Um, uh, didn't stop uh, his uh, constituents from reelecting him, but he did, uh, he did pay a price for, for his crimes. Um, so he they were going to be met by Traficant at the Peace Bridge, uh, and Traficant was going to handcuff himself to Rudolph, and then they're going to walk into the United States, and uh, when... Uh, uh, if stopped by um, immigration inspectors on the bridge, uh, who would say, you know, Arthur Rudolph is not eligible to re-enter the United States, um, uh, the congressman supposedly was going to say, uh, well, I am en route to vote uh, in Washington. I'm a U.S. congressman. You can't interfere with that. And it just so happens that this man is handcuffed uh, to me. Um, and uh, uh, when I heard of those plans from an informant, uh, I, I phoned uh, U.S. immigration. And they patched me through to an inspector on the bridge, uh, clearly a veteran uh, of, uh, of service uh, there. Uh, he had been there during the Vietnam uh, protest period and had seen it all, seen every kind of protest you could imagine. And so when I breathlessly told him uh, my uh, story of what we'd been told the traffickant's plan was, um, he very calmly responded, we'll, we'll take care of that. And I was both comforted and curious. Uh, so I said, it's great to hear that, um, but how are you going to handle it? He said, oh, uh, if the congressman shows up with Arthur Rudolph handcuffed to his wrist, we will handcuff Rudolph's other wrist to the bridge, and we will tell the congressman that he is welcome uh, to stay there for as long as he likes. Uh, in the end, in the end, uh, uh, they did go to Canada. They did go to, I think, Niagara Falls, but they never had the nerve to try uh, crossing the bridge. And I don't think uh, Congressman Traficant uh, actually joined them there. So I know we're almost out of time, so I wanted to be sure to say something, Greg, if I may, about the Demiano case, since that was mentioned in the, the billing for, for, for this, uh, this, this session. Um, he was, as I mentioned, initially exposed as a Sobibor death camp guard uh, in uh, Soviet uh, publications, both in Ukrainian uh, and in English in the 1970s. Case was uh, uh, brought uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office out in Cleveland before, um, you know, where he lived uh, before OSI was created. Um, the case has a long convoluted history, which many of, uh, many in the audience will be familiar with. There's not time to, to describe it now. Um, uh, it was ultimately, it was initially prosecuted as a Treblinka death camp case, and that unraveled eventually. Uh, uh, we, uh, when I became director, we refiled it as a Sobibor death camp case, won it, uh, uh, won that case, shared our evidence with the Germans, and they then uh, brought their criminal prosecution when we deported Demyanyuk to Germany in 2009, based largely on our evidence. In the first go round um, in the 80s, uh, the only um, wartime evidence that we had against Demyanyuk was an identity card uh, issued at the Trevniki SS base and training camp in German-occupied Poland. It had his, his photograph um, and his uh, particulars, and it showed an assignment to Sobobor. Demyanyuk and his supporters, among them Pat Buchanan, consistently uh, charged that that was a Soviet forgery. Well, we had it tested in every way possible. There was no reason to believe it was a forgery. Uh, but that remained Demyanyuk's uh, contention also when he went uh, on trial in Israel after uh, his first litigation in the United States. Uh, by the time we brought the, the Sobobor case upon his return from Israel, uh, we had uh, reinvestigated the case from scratch and found 
lots of other documents, some in the former Soviet Union and some in the West, including a West German archive. Uh, the evidence was, was uh, beyond compelling, uh, was airtight really. And um, uh, at, uh, in the retrial of the citizenship revocation case, the denaturalization case in Cleveland, uh, Demyanyuk argued that uh, evidence, the evidence was still, still forged, uh, including uh, one particularly important document that an OSI staff historian found in an archive in one of the Soviet successor states uh, long after the Soviet Union had gone out of business. And um, we pointed out to the judge that it's ludicrous to believe that the KGB would go to great effort to forge an incriminating document against Demyanyuk and then not only never give it to the Americans or the Israelis, um, but bury it in an archive on the chance that someday the Soviet Union, uh, which historically always barred Western uh, researchers and scholars and law enforcement authorities from their archives, um, which was a tragedy for the, the writing of, of the history of the war and the Holocaust in particular, but um, uh, so the theory would be they would bury it in the archives on the possibility that someday the Soviet Union might collapse and someone would go into the archive and find it. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And the judge adopted that, that very argument. But we, we uh, over the years, had uh, any number of adventures uh, in, in the area of, uh, of Soviet evidence. Um, and ultimately, I have to say, uh, it, it became uh, un, un, untenable really for us to use uh, witnesses from the Soviet Union uh, in large part because um, uh, an attorney general of the United States had publicly expressed um, uh, doubts about whether they would testify truthfully. And when the head of your agency says that, um, puts prosecutors in a very difficult position. I know our time is just about up, but I just want to say thank you, Eli. And I know we could go on for hours and at some point we might, but I think I just want to conclude by saying, you know, it's important to know that cases that were investigated and prosecuted under Eli Rosenbaum's directions have resulted in deportations to Europe of Nazi perpetrators subsequently convicted there of participation in tens of thousands of Holocaust murders. He is truly one of uh, our heroes, truly one of the Department of Justice's heroes. And I'm just glad to call him personally a friend and also the Jackson Center to call you a friend. So thank you for your participation today, Eli. Greg, you're much too kind. I can accept those very generous words only on the thought that whatever accomplishments are attributed to me are really accomplishments of, of a great team of attorneys, historians, um, paralegals, uh, other staff at OSI and now HRSP that, that makes, uh, make, make those accomplishments possible. It's, it's a great privilege always uh, to, to um, uh, be associated with, with the Jackson Center. Congratulations to the center and to you, Greg, personally, for uh, 20 years of remarkable, remarkable uh, work. Thank you. The Eli Rosenbaum. <laughs>